Welcome to Pasadena Monthly. I'm your host, Justin Chapman. After taking a look at what's been going on in Pasadena this past month, we'll speak with our guest, Pasadena Fire Chief Chad Augustin. But before we get started, let's check out these Pasadena Media News Briefs. Pasadena's Black Infant Health Program, or BIH, works to address persistent racial disparities in infant mortality and preterm birth rates among African American families. The BIH strives to provide a culturally affirming environment and to honor the unique history of African American women. The BIH program has recently expanded its service area to cover the entire San Gabriel Valley. It is open to black and African American women who are at least 16 years old and either pregnant or up to six months postpartum. The program received initial funding in 1989. The preliminary report says they will continue to seek funding beyond June 30th, 2026, when the current cycle ends. For more information, please visit cityofpasadena.net slash public health. Friends Indeed is set to commemorate 130 years of community service with a celebratory event. This organization, known for its long-standing commitment to addressing local needs, will host a free birthday party open to the public on August 27th from 5 to 8 p.m. at the First United Methodist Church of Pasadena. The celebration aims to bring together community members for an evening of reflection and gratitude. Attendees can expect food, activities, and a nostalgic journey through Friends and Deeds history, highlighting the organization's impact over more than a century. To attend the celebration, register online at friendsindeedpas.org slash 130th birthday celebration. To learn more about Friends and Deed, visit friendsindeedpas.org. Attention California renters. Rental security deposits in California are being cut substantially under a new law. Assembly Bill 12, effective July 1, 2024, mandates that security deposits be limited to one month's rent. Consequently, the cost to move into a furnished rental in California will be reduced by half. In addition, for unfurnished units, maximum move-in cost will decrease by a third. Some exceptions may apply. Massive security deposits can create insurmountable barriers to housing affordability and accessibility for millions of Californians, said the bill's author, Assemblymember Matt Haney, in a recent statement. This legislation aims to make moving more affordable for residents. Stay informed and take advantage of these important changes. Let's turn next to our lightning round of news updates. One, the Pasadena City Council will hold a study session on the grants passed Supreme Court case and its implications for the city's homelessness policy at its meeting on August 26th. The Supreme Court ruled that municipalities could implement bans on camping on public property. Recently, California Governor Gavin Newsom issued an executive order requiring state agencies to clear encampments that pose safety risks in areas such as freeways and state parks. His order also required giving advance notice to vacate connect the unhoused to services, and help store their belongings for at least two months. Congressmember Adam Schiff, the likely next California senator, and 10 other representatives introduced the Mail Accessibility and Inclusion for Low-Income Families Act, which would provide free post office boxes for unhoused individuals. Two, the City Council finalized ballot language for several charter amendment measures that will now go to voters in November, including council term limits, campaign contribution limits, selection of the vice mayor, a 30-day city residency requirement for vacant council seat appointments rather than the original six months in a specific district, and more. Three, the South Pasadena Police Department became the first in the country to employ an all-electric police fleet, including 20 Tesla Model Y pursuit vehicles and Model 3 administrative vehicles. The city said the new fleet will reduce 10% uh, of its total greenhouse gas emissions. Four, with the college football playoff changing its postseason schedule, the Rose Bowl game organizers have decided to keep their game on New Year's Day rather than continue to be part of the semifinal rotation. The Rose Bowl will host quarterfinals in the current 12-team format this year and next. Schedules for 2026 and beyond remain to be seen. If the current 12-team setup continues, the other six bowl games on New Year's would be semifinals, with the Rose Bowl remaining a quarterfinal. Five, as of this taping, Five candidates have pulled nomination papers, but only three have qualified for three Pasadena Unified School District Board of Education races, which will be decided in November. Those include incumbent Jennifer Hall Lee and former teacher Juan Carlos Perez in District 2, Scott Hardin in District 4, and incumbent Tina Fredericks and Lisa Kroos in District 6. The nomination period closed August 9th after this episode was filmed. 
Since POSD uses plurality, plurality elections, the candidate with the most votes wins, even if they don't get 50% plus one. Six, voters will also decide this November whether to establish a new elected county CEO, increase the number of LA County Board of Supervisors from five to nine members, and create an ethics commission. This would be the most significant reform of county government in more than a century, which many believe is long overdue because of the immense concentration of power in just five supervisors for such a large area with such a large population. Seven, the city issued a notice of availability calling for developers to join the mental health treatment and housing project at the former Kaiser property on Lake Avenue and Villa Street. The city purchased the 2.28 acre site last year for $12 million, of which the county was supposed to contribute half until talks on that fell apart. However, the city and county are continuing discussions about how to manage the site and provided much needed services. Eight, the city's new rent stabil stabilization department released preliminary data on the rental housing inquiries and complaints it received from 252 tenants and 352 landlords, a 41% to 59% uh, split between March 1st and June 30th of this year. The most pressing issues were rent increases and eviction notices. The department also fielded inquiries about relocation assistance and alleged harassment. Nine, voters will also weigh in this November on a $195 million bond that will help restore the Central Library. Those repairs include retrofitting the building for earthquake safety, meeting current fire safety regulations, replacing the leaky roof, removing hazardous materials such as asbestos and lead paint, updating outdated technology, and restoring library services. The measure states that the bond will cost up to $28.90 per $100,000 of assessed property value, but the city's assessment is that the average will actually be closer to about $20. There will be two levels of oversight for the bond, if approved. An annual report will be submitted directly to the City Council, and a Citizens Oversight Commission will be impaneled. And 10, JPL's Perseverance rover found potential evidence of ancient life on Mars in the form of a veiny arrowhead-shaped rock called Sheava Falls that may have hosted microbial life billions of years ago. Further research is required to confirm the findings. The rock was discovered on the northern edge of Nareva Vallis, an ancient valley that was carved by water rushing into Jezero Crater a very, very long time ago. Let's welcome our guest, Pasadena Fire Chief Chad Augustine. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for the invite. It's great to be here. Chief Augustine is the 12th Chief of the Pasadena Fire Department. He comes to Pasadena from the Sacramento Fire Department where he worked for more than 20 years and in a broad range of areas, including operations, administration, human resources, professional standards, training, emergency medical services, and fire prevention. He began as a firefighter paramedic and moved through the ranks to the position he held since 2015 as deputy fire chief, allowing him the opportunity to work in every division in the department. He is a certified paramedic and has worked as a flight paramedic for numerous years. So tell, tell us a little more uh, about your career. You came from Sacramento. How does that compare to Pasadena, different, similar? It's, I actually started my career in Pismo Beach and I, I mentioned that mm -hmm. Uh, cause that's where I met my wife. Mm -hmm. And so that's like such a, a an important part of w where I am and who I am today. Mm -hmm. And I grew up just outside of Sacramento. And so I was thrilled to get hired with Sacramento Fire Department. Big city, um, busy, lots of opportunities to, to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. It's also a challenging city to work in. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's there's just so much going on there, public safety, is one of numerous priorities, maybe not the top priority. And so uh, it's just a challenge to get the resources that you truly need. Mm -hmm. um, and so coming to Pasadena really was a breath of fresh air. Um, I love working for this community. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, big enough and challenging enough that it has complex issues, but small enough that you can actually get to know people. Right. Um, and the support to the fire department is incredible. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, the city, uh, the region, the, the state, obviously facing heightened uh, a wildfire risk this summer. Um, you know, what does the fire department do to help prevent that? And, and, uh, and what can residents do to be prepared? Great question. And after a, a couple of years of really mild fire seasons, we can't let our guard down. This year has been already devastating. Mm -hmm. um, to date, year to date, there's almost 800,000 acres burned in California. Um, and we, you know, it seems like every single day you turn on the news and it's somewhere in our community within an hour's distance, you have 
um, a wildfire and homes burning or being threatened. And so uh, really what we say is, um, hey, be a, good, be a good partner to help your Pasadena Fire Department. Each year we do 4,000 brush inspections in our very high fire hazard severity zones. And, and you can think of that as basically on the west and the east side of town. Mm -hmm. um, and really that's our opportunity to, to walk the property with each resident, show them the areas that might, uh, might help fire spread if there's a fire in their neighborhood and how they can harden their home to keep their house from burning. And so we really wanna do a, a, we call it prevention and education and we don't wanna employ the, the enforcement arm of that at all if, mm. if possible. And so we do those 4,000 brush inspections. And then, uh, you know, from the, from the things that our, our residents can do, they can really work on being prepared. Um, they can know multiple evacuation routes of how to get out of their home, uh, driving um, not just one route, but a primary and a secondary route they can have a go bag with everything that you would need to, to live for you know 72 even uh, 72 hours 96 hours uh, including medications and cash and food for your for your furry friends um, and then uh, really uh, making sure that you sign up for Nixle and please so that if there is an emergency we can get a hold of you some of those are opt-in programs we want to be able to quickly notify you um, so that you have time to evacuate mm -hmm. And the, the, the brush inspections, are those, uh, is that something residents can sign up for or are those pre-selected uh, uh, heightened risk uh, uh, properties? Yep. Any, any uh, resident that lives in what's designated as that very high fire hazard severity zone, and we have just under 4,000 residences that fall into that category, we're going to inspect those annually. Gotcha. Um, and and uh, special attention is paid to the Arroyo. Obviously, it's sort of a, it's a natural area. Um, a lot of homes in, in that area as well. What role does a fire department play in brush clearance and, and partnering with the Parks Department? It's a, it's a great question. Um, some of those 4,000 uh, inspections fall into that area. Um, we also partner with our, our Parks Department and, and some of their uh, contract companies that they use to help them especially leading up to the 4th of July, because even though fireworks are illegal, we know that um, all you have to do is um, you know, look up into the sky and, and open your window and you're gonna hear fireworks. And so, oh, well, that's such a beautiful area. We wanna keep it beautiful mm -hmm. and free from fire. So we really work hard leading up to the 4th and then all year round um, to, to keep that area um, pristine, um, beautiful to its natural habitat, but also to uh, clearing brush where possible so that we mm -hmm. can make it as safe as possible. And so if residents hiking notice some brush uh, areas that look like it needs cleaning up, should they reach out to parks, a fire department? Yeah, they, either one, okay. right? Like, uh, depends on the area. Mm -hmm. what, what's most important is we want to get in there and get it cleaned up and, yeah. and reduce that and mitigate that hazard. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and tell us uh, about some of the uh, challenges that, that Pasadena faces in particular from, from the fire department's perspective. Yeah, I, I think of... Um, Pasadena is, it's just a neat city, right? Um, as Mayor Gordo says, we're the center of the universe. Um, we live in Southern California. We're at risk for a no notice event at any time and specifically thinking about an earthquake. Um, and in the last year, we've had numerous small earthquakes all around us. Um, we're also uh, home to Caltech and JPL, the Rose Bowl, the Rose Parade. Those are high, high profile events. Um, where if you had a bad actor wanting to do um, an intentional bad event, um, Pasadena is on the map. Um, so it's really important that your Pasadena Fire Department um, trains regularly with our law enforcement partners. And thankfully, we have a wonderful working relationship with our Pasadena Police Department. Mm -hmm. um, we train regularly. Just last month, we worked on active shooter training. We did um, some real life scenarios at Caltech. That's just one of uh, numerous examples of training that we do so that our residents can enjoy Pasadena and feel safe. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the city's um, emergency evacuation plan. Um, you, you know, what about areas like, um, I know there's a citywide plan. What about areas like Linda Vista, San Rafael, hillside areas, especially during big Rose Bowl events? Uh, what should residents do in that situation? I'll take a step back to when I got here about three and a half years ago. Um, I was surprised that the city didn't have an evacuation plan. And, and so within the first year, we started working with a consultant for nearly two years to develop a citywide evacuation plan. And it's really meant to be an all hazards plan 
but we focus on wildfire because that's one of our greatest threats. Um, and thankfully, there's so much technology right now, and not that we want to overly rely on technology, but even 10 years ago, if you had a, an event at a Rose Bowl um, with 50,000 people or more in the stands and you had a wildfire, we'd be in trouble. Mm -hmm. the, the roadways in the Linda Vista Royal area, you have narrow roads, one way in, one way out in some areas, you have rising terrain. Now we have uh, predictive modeling and fire mapping that allows us to really, you take in the winds, the weather fuel topography, and you can really accurately predict the the direction that that fire is gonna spread. Mm -hmm. And we can do it over 30, 60, 90 minutes, up to three hours. And that tells us, okay, where is this fire gonna be? Who do we need to evacuate? Who do we need to shelter in place? What's the optimal routes? Um, can we can we keep the Rose Bowl patrons sheltered while we evacuate these, these four neighborhoods or this area? Mm -hmm. Um, and then we can actually safely get them evacuated rather than trying to shotgun and evacuate, you know, the entire uh, area only to have the roads clogged up because we can't get in while, the, while people are trying to evacuate. So um, while there's still much work to do, uh, this has been an area of really high focus for us so that, because we know it's just a matter of time before we have another brush fire in, in this area. Right. And, and uh, the city has a, a relatively new uh, emergency preparedness coordinator, right, yeah. Nayeli? Yeah, N and Nayeli is, she's just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, she is uh, she is one person at a time, one group at a time, helping us become more prepared. Mm -hmm. We're doing tabletop exercises and prepared Pasadena, which is a smaller version of CERT, really just helping our community be more prepared. Um, and a, a really good example is we had to do an evacuation of a large building the other night um, that had a, about 100 residents in it. And most of those were really high need people with some mental health issues mm -hmm. called Naomi after hours. She's so well connected with the county emergency manager and the Red Cross. And we're, we were uh, developing a plan for uh, transportation and shelter and mm -hmm. everything that we would need for that. That's her area of expertise. And, and so she's just a great addition to the city. Our community, every single day that she's working, is just a little bit safer because of her work. That's great. Um, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the city's ambulance subscription program. Yeah, so we're really fortunate that Pasadena Fire provides ambulance transport, and we've done so for over 40 years. Um, I say it's part of the, the Cadillac service of the Pasadena Way. Mm -hmm. um, some cities contract with a private ambulance company. Some cities provide their own ambulance transport. Um, thankfully, we provide our own ambulance transport, which means that we control where those ambulances are. They're not po like a private ambulance company. They may be posting covering multiple cities mm -hmm. and, longer, and longer response times. Uh, whether it's a private company or a, or a public fire department, uh, an ambulance transport is not covered under your basic um, fire protection service. And so you're going to have a, you're going to have an ambulance transport bill. Mm -hmm. um, and for many of us, your insurance covers a portion of that and you're left with either a deductible or you have a copay. Um, and so, and for, for many of us, you're living paycheck to paycheck and all of a sudden you get this, this large deductible. And, uh, in addition to a, a hospital bill and um, it's stressful. Mm -hmm. And so this is a program that gives you peace of mind for $85 a year. Uh, it covers you and anyone living under your rooftop and whatever bill, whatever portion of the bill that the insurance company does not pay, the rest is waived under that subscription mm -hmm. program. So really good peace of mind. Yeah, and if people can just go on the city's website and sign up. For yep, that. they can go under the city's website, under the fire department's website, it takes you to a direct link to sign up for it. Great. And, and um, uh, how can uh, the, the community um, better understand what the fire department does? So, oh, I, I think a lot of people have a vague idea of, of what, the, the, what firefighters do. Um, but, you know, I've gone in a couple ride-alongs. Uh, I went and did the, uh, the uh, tra fire training out in Glendale where you go into uh, a room with simulated, well, with real fire, but a simulated uh, training uh, uh, exercise. And it is no joke. It is no joke what they, they go through. And it was really eye-opening in terms of, of what uh, firefighters are experiencing every day. Um, and, and just uh, the things they see out on just everyday calls. They're, they're sitting around, and when a call comes in, they drop everything and, and, and go to sometimes life-threatening situations. 
you, you know, how can the community learn more about that and, and, and become better, better educated about what the fire department actually does and, and provides? That's a, it's a great question. Um, and your Pasadena Fire Department responds out to serve our community on their worst day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to your point, it could be a medical call, it could be a, a structure fire, or a brush fire, but we do a lot of other things. We do fire prevention, we do brush inspections like we talked about, we do fire plans review. We have two port teams, which is your Pasadena Outreach Response Team. It's a firefighter, it's a clinical social worker, and it's a registered nurse. And, and they're going out specifically to, to find whatever the barrier is, um, um, for those experiencing homelessness mm -hmm. or on the verge of homelessness to reduce those barriers to get them um, permanent housing. Um, we also do a special event management, which I, I don't think a lot of people realize, but anytime there's an event at the Rose Bowl or a concert at Brookside, your Pasadena Fire Department, along with the P Pasadena Police Department, we're doing the public safety. And, and I would put my members up against anybody in the country when it comes to event management. And that, Protecting uh, 80 or 85,000 people um, on a on a Fourth of July soccer game uh, is is a big undertaking. Right. And so, from the, the operations, the fire prevention, the medical, you name it, uh, the pyrotechnics behind with making sure that there's it's a safe operation and permitted, all of that comes through the fire department. Um, if if you want to learn more, we have an annual fire service day mm -hmm. at Jefferson Elementary. And we really talk about all the different things that your Pasadena Fire Department does. Great. And um, does the does the department have all the resources it needs? Is it or is it always a challenge to, to, to manage those resources? I'm going to give you the attorney answer. <laughs> it depends, right? Uh, on most given Tuesdays, uh, and I'm just making that up, uh, if there's nothing special going on in Pasadena, which is, as we know, that's a rarity, we have about the, the, the correct amount of resources. Mm -hmm. um, but we just added an ambulance uh, last year, and it's the first operational resource that's been added in almost 20 years. During that time, our call volume has gone through the roof. Um, we're a small uh, geographical city, 24 square miles-ish, um, and but we keep doing infill, and we're an aging population, call volume goes up, and the threats are ever increasing. Mm -hmm. We're working uh, with a consultant right now on a strategic plan for our next five years of where the city is going and how our resources um, need to be able to support that. So I do expect that in the next few years, we're gonna need to be advocating for additional resources. Mm -hmm. And then on any day when we have special events, we rely on, on mutual aid from all of our surrounding uh, jurisdictions. We help our neighbors in need, they help us in need. Great, well, Chief Augustine, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and, and talking about your work. It, uh, it, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you to our community. Thank you for allowing me to be here and thank you to our community for the support of Pasadena Fund. Thanks so much for all you do, thank appreciate you. it. Before we go, here is this month in Pasadena history. It was this month in 1957 when the radio station KPCC, then known as KPCS and now known as LAS 89.3, first went on the air from the Pasadena City College campus from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. every weekday, and began broadcasting all day in October 1962. It had no commercials, and it was one of the few FCC-licensed station in the nation operated by a two-year college. KPCS stood for Pasadena City Schools, which was operated by and for students. KPCS changed to KPCC on December 1, 1979, and then to Elias last year. In 2010, the station moved to its current facility on Raymond Avenue, and it continues to be operated by Southern California Public Radio. Thank you all so much for joining me for this episode of Pasadena Monthly. Tune in every fourth Friday of the month at 5 p.m. Learn more at PasadenaMedia.org and JustinDouglasChapman.com. Drop me a line at jchapman at cityofpasadena.net. We'll see you next time.